Greetings ladies and mentalgens and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Chrysalis Chapter 5 written by Beaverfur. Now Cat's legs hurt. It was a deep, constant pain that increased with every movement, accompanied by the stiffness and slowly but surely it had spread to envelop his whole body over the last days. In a way, he was surprised. He had always been taught that his species had evolved to jog up and down the expensive grass hills of his home planet, and that was the reason why the Sanxians were so good at walking on uneven terrain. But apparently someone forgot to tell Dalcat's body that. He had spent the last days a hostage of Jovet's Commissionary of Agriculture. The effusive and surprisingly short Zinverian informed him of everything that there was to know of and more about farming and planetary and colony world. They had visited irrigation projects, organic tree plantations, mountain farms, grand decalcification facilities, fresh river farms, red grass fields, ball tree farms, valley sweet thorn cultivation works, and all the other places whose names Dow Cat couldn't even decide to remember. If he didn't know better, he would have thought the commissionary was suspected the visit motives were of fabrication and was punishing him for it. But no. Either the Zinvarian was a great actor, or his intentions were honest, and Dalcat leaned forward for the latter. There simply was a certain mindset to people who willingly chose to move to a new world, a colony in the periphery of the Republic, which itself was the periphery of the galaxy, to a world in development without comforts of civilization. Colonies attracted a certain kind of people, honest, enthusiastic, and hardworking, a mindset that was increasingly rare amongst the inhabitants of the large metropolitans where Dalcat had spent most of his formative years. He walked up to his room's view and looked out at Jovet's biggest and, in his opinion, only city. The town's location had been carefully chosen. It was built on a natural bay that gave its settlers access to the planet's single large ocean but whose surrounding mountains protected it from the worst of the seasonal storms that periodically battered the continent. It was a mix of match of prefabricated boxy white houses, warehouses, and workshops. Here and there, high-rise constructions of bare concrete and steel emerged from the sea of houses, such as the lodging that he was staying at. He refused to dignify this place by referring to it as a hotel. The wide avenues, decorated with the local lush trees, only made the lack of actual motorized traffic even more apparent. While the main city enjoyed far more activity than the other towns Dalcat had been recently visiting, it would be far cool to say that it was bustling. In some sense, Dalcat felt as if he had somehow traveled back in time, or was visiting some sort of pre-space faring civilization. The town, the whole colony, had an outdated air to it, the avenues would suddenly turn to dirt roads, forcing the ground vehicles to default to the dangerous manual piloting. Or, sometimes he would come across a small house made entirely of wood. Of all things, it made for an odd contrast with the scattered displays of high technology that he could glimpse at times. The recycling plants, in particular, were a state-of-the-art, even by council standards. And the spaceport, right across the street from the building he was at, featured an endless showcase of moderns and variant starships entering and leaving the planet's atmosphere. He could even see the embassy ship, the white wedge-shaped vehicle with gold ascents and elegant designs etched to the surface that Naksani and him had used to get there. It had parked right at the edge of the enormous bare expanse of the asphalt that was Jovet's only spaceport. He glanced across the bay towards the Colonial Directorate building, where his boss was at the moment. Always one step ahead, Naktani had excused herself out of the agrarian excursion and decided to stay at the Directorate, visiting the local governors and high-ranking officers. The reasoning she had explained to him in private was that should the planet be attacked, its defenses would be coordinated out of that building being that there, when it happened, she had said, would give them the first-hand information on Zinva's enemies. Dalcat suspected the true reasons had more to do with aching legs and long-winded explanations on water reprocessing techniques. He relaxed his eyes' membranes, letting them water as he tried eyes, and slowly he sat down in the room's only chair, which uh, creaked under his weight. The cursed thing, letting out a breath, he activated his augmented irises and started going through the documents and the work that he'd been neglecting for the past few days. 
He was reading a long-winded explanation of the Republic's repurposed amendment to the export treaties, trying for the second time to unpack the particularly annoying sentences, when the link to his boss opened. Hi, Cat, she said. Have any plans for this afternoon? Even when sub-vocalizing, Dowcat could pick up the terse tone. Or maybe he was just imagining things. Yes, actually, I'm visiting an animal food reprocessing facility. Why don't you join me? I'm sure you'll enjoy it, he replied, half-jokingly. Ah, maybe you should consider getting a sprained tendon or something. Stay here this afternoon. He paused. No, he hadn't imagined anything. Something was going on. Wait, what is happening now? As the only response he received was a vid link, he opened it, a floating screen only he could see appearing in the midair. It was a direct feed from her irises showing him what she was seeing. Nakstani was standing in some sort of control room, standing next to a large screen along a group of Zinverian colonel officers. The screen showed a view of Yovit from orbit, and a fleet of defensive military ships clearly visible, and a purple icon indicating a... An incoming warp tunnel, Daukat muttered. Yes, time to collapse is three hours. It could be civilian vessel, but, um, no flight plan, he ventured, reading the screen. All civilian ships were supposed to relay warp jump plans to the authorities ahead of time. No, there remained silence for a few seconds. Should I join you there, he said at last. No, you're one street away from the spaceport as it is. If we have to evacuate, go to our ship and wait for me there. He nodded and then muttered an affirmative when he realized that she couldn't see him. Keep this vid link open though, she added. They went back in a tense silence, watching the countdown timer. Meanwhile, Daokat composed a short message to the Commissioner of Agriculture, excusing himself out of the afternoon's activities. A sprained tendon. Some time later, he watched through Zakstani's feet as a group of military officers entered the control room and started evicting all the civilians. They tried to kick her out of the room too, but she very calmly declared having direct authorization by the Emperor himself to oversee any military operations. Darkat snorted, but the Zinvarians appeared to buy her bluff and let her stay, or maybe they just had more urgent stuff to worry about. In the screen, the timer was down to one hour. Dalcat opened a large cabinet in his room and took a small travel bag. He placed the synthetic food bars and medical supplies that he always traveled with in case of emergencies. Then he added some extra clothing items and an energy handgun all council embassy members were issued with. Just in case. Half an hour. The Zinvarian fleet had adopted a strange and very sparse formation in front of the warp tunnel's estimated exit point. Dalcat absentmindedly looked up at the sky from his window, but, of course, he couldn't see anything. Just a blue sky with some puffy white clouds. In the avenue outside, the sparse traffic flowed as usual. Dalcat almost expected sirens to have gone off by now. It seemed that the Zimvarians were either very confident or would come, or they were still playing their cards close to their chests. He wondered if this was Naksani's presence and the colony had anything to do with that. It's not like there were many places for the locals to take refuge in, though. Their best option would be running out of the city and into the farmlands and the mountains surrounding it. Evacuating the planet, as always, was also out of the question. In the history of the council, many military leaders had proposed plans for evacuating worlds in case of a military attack, but invariably they tended to be infeasible. Planets with large populations were simply impossible to evacuate in time, even when dedicating entire transport fleets to the task. The colonies, like Yovet and most of their population, dispersed across the land, and in places where transportation was spotty and there was no easy access to a spaceport. And even if there had been a way to evacuate the civilians, they'd be put in orbit, right in the middle of the upcoming battle right where they could be easily captured or mistaken for combatant vessels. No, the best recommendation in case of planetary assault was to hunker down and weather the worst of it. Civilians were usually respected and eventually wars ended, treaties were signed and the solution was reached for the local population. If the Terrans won here, they'd take over the colony and set their own interim government that could last months. It would give Nakstani and him an opportunity to talk formally with the newly discovered species, while also overseeing the Zinvarian population wasn't mistreated. But it wouldn't hurt to be prepared, just in case it had a hunker down themselves, he thought, eyeing his travel bag. 
or if Nakstani decided it would be better to leave the planet altogether and take their chances up in orbit. Soon, after the counter had reached 20 minutes, the screen shifted from the orbital view to the detailed zoom-in visual of the projected exit point. Ten minutes. Even though the feed, Dalkat could feel the tense Naksani was. No joking this time. Five minutes. Dalkat closed his travel bag and placed it in the center of the room, sitting back in the chair. He glanced at the cabinet and the expensive outfits he would be leaving behind, but quickly focused back on the vid link. One minute. Naksani let out a breath. Now Kant realized that he was holding his own. 30 seconds. This was it. 10. He watched the countdown timer went through the last numbers. 5. His eye membranes contracted almost on their own, as if to protect the delicate eyeballs. 3. 2. 1. 0. The instant seemed to stretch, lasting forever as they were caught inside some time dilation effect. And for a single, hopeful moment, Dalka was sure that the timer would update again to simply show plus one, the Terrans having missed their appointment. And then time would return to its normal speed, and he would relax, and Aksani would have made some joke at that. The image on the screen changed. The first thought was one of incomprehension. Dalka had expected the enemy fleet to pour out of the warp with battleships and escorting cruisers and formations and all that. But that wasn't what happened. No. Clearly, there was something out there, but he couldn't make sense of the image. Then, he view zoomed in, putting the image in context, and he understood. It was impossible, of course. They would have known. The Galactic Council I would have shared and known were the civilization of the Orion Arm capable of building such a thing. The amount of resources involved, the amount of time, of energy, and to put in the monsters into space. And yet, there it was. A starship the size of a city, as in defiance of the laws of physics and economics. Many expletives crossed his mind, competing for attention. But somehow, he couldn't opt to just use one of them. There just wasn't a word to reflect his astonishment. The complete impossibility of the scene, so he remained silent. Nakstani, of course, didn't have such problems. Just who are these cursed, mulch-munching bastards picking a fight with? She muttered. She was still trying to process the implications when the image changed again. New ships joining the oversized monster. It now looked closer to what Dalcat had originally expected. A flagship with its escorting vessels. Except that each ship was smaller, vehicle was large enough to qualify as its own flagship on their own. Larger than any capital ship of any of the fleets of the nations that formed the Galactic Council. Odds were, he realized, that he was looking at nine biggest starships in the entire galaxy. Um, he said to no one. And then, just as Dalkat thought he couldn't be more surprised, the screen started filling in hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of icons as new contacts appeared. Entire waves of smaller vehicles coming out of the larger ships. There were so many of them the sensors couldn't keep pace, the red icons moving and dancing around the massive vessels as if they were schools of fish and a giant sea creature. Like a... a swarm. There wasn't any better word to describe it. He absentmindedly noticed that he was back in the standing position, having left the chair at some point during the last moments, but he paid no attention to it. In the screen, the Terrans were beginning their attack, moving a large group towards one of the defending battleships, apparently chosen at random. Are the Zavarians trying to contact them? Dalkat asked. Yes, his boss replied. I got them to add our own message too, but no response so far. Dalkat felt a strange anger at developing situation. It would almost seemed obscene to use such a display of force, to make such an overwhelmingly powerful attack against such a small colony world as if the Terrans had no sense of proportion whatsoever. The reasoning for the Zinvarian's weird formation became quickly apparent as the rest of their warships moved towards the flanks of the enemy, encircling the swarm and opening fire with all their energy weapons at the same time. Dozens of beams crisscrossed the intervening space. As their screen struggled to reflect the amount of Terran casualties, the hundreds of ships that they were losing under the howl of combined laser fire of the Zimvarians was unleashing upon them. It appeared the smaller Terran craft weren't protected by any kind of shields. But still, the blob didn't seem to thin, stoically enduring the assault without ever slowing its advance. 
With a shiver, Dalcat wondered if each of those small craft was carrying a pilot. If so, retaining such a level of discipline under the conditions that they were being subjected to would speak volumes about Terran mindset. Would they use some sort of brainwashing, conditioning, training, drugs? Were they some society built on honor or total obedience? on the complete negation of individual needs for the good of the collective. Somehow, he doubted that they would be piloted. It was easier to refuse the idea that any sentient being would allow beings subjected to that. But his memory reminded him of the swarm's target, the Zuvarian battleship that had been singled out by the Terrans and had submitted itself to its role as bait, as defiantly piloted by its crew. He muttered a curse, Dalcat had always known that there was something strangely horrifying about war, some kind of rational madness to it, but seeing it play out in front of him was quite a different beast than learning about it from the safety of a philosophical essay. He saw the Terran's craft finally reaching their obje objective and slowly began to envelop the doomed battleship, and then things started happening very fast. A white flash on the screen marked the disappearance of the targeted ship along with small chunks of the enemy swarm. A few instants later, seven more flashes followed, each of them positioned as close to the Zimbarian vessel. Nakstani pronounced the words, Nuclear weapons. Dalkett's mind raced to consider the diplomatic consequences of detonating thermonuclear ordnance in the orbit of an inhabited green world, in direct contravention to the most fundamental war treaties of the Galactic Federal Council. But he abandoned that train of thought as he saw the eight massive Terran escorting ships do something impossible. All of a sudden, they shot out their main blob of the astonishing speed, their acceleration so disproportionately high that there was no way the ship's structure could even handle such extreme forces, let alone how whatever crew was manning them hadn't been instantly turned to paste. Each of them was aiming towards one of the main Zinvarian battleships, the ones that had stood out of the range of the swarm during the entire battle. The ones that housed the fleet admirals and tactical command centers. The Terran ships had crossed most of the empty space, separating them from the battleships in just a couple seconds. But they didn't stop, they just kept accelerating, homing in on their targets. One instant too late, Dalcat realized that they didn't intend to stop, the Terrans were using their own ships as oversized battering rams, as missiles. In his mind, he cinched it. The Terrans were lunatics, berserk species that lacked any moral consideration towards the lives of even their own crews. The Zinvarian battleship had been caught in surprise in the strange maneuver. They fired their thrusters desperately, trying to get out of the way, but they just couldn't match the maddening levels of acceleration to their Terran counterparts. A moment later, Dalcat stared in disbelief as the information representing the target's vessels simply vanished from the screen. Nakstani's terse voice interrupted his speed. Dalcat, she said, not bothering to sub-vocalize, we're evacuating, go to the spaceport, get into our ship and come pick me up here. As if on cue, the rest of the Terran swarm exploded, small dots flying everywhere, towards each and one of the remaining Zavarian ships. They even towards the planet itself. Dalcat noted as he reached for his travel bag and left the room, his heart beating fast. The Zinvarian carefully formation was in shambles. Amazingly, half the Terran giant escort ships had survived their respective impacts and were coming in for a second pass. The defending fleet was disorganized, some ships turning to respond to the new menace, others trying to contain the rising tide of the swarm. A series of white flashes followed, and more signal icons simply disappeared. Nakstani's biddling stared, freezing, losing visual coherence, interference continuously blocking the image and sound now. Right, Dalcat thought. All those nuclear explosions must have been bathing the planet in a storm of electromagnetic pulses, and their communicators just weren't designed to operate under such conditions. Scampering down the stairs, he'd closed the video and saved the bandwidth, keeping the audio link alive. He looked back at the sky as soon as he exited the building. A mesmerizing green and red aurora covered the whole horizon, north to south. It was slowly spreading, dancing lazily above the clouds. Dalcat ran towards the adjacent spaceport, dodging the locals who stood motionless all over the street looking at the sky. He didn't fault them, though. They might sight was beautiful in a horrifying kind of way. He heard the sudden voice of his boss, Dalcat, she said, all but screamed, We got to go and... Uh, repeat that, 
the link was cutting. Sid, warn you, me, ship. Dowcat, I now turning purple sky. What had she said? Something about ship. He was now running past the large landing gear of the giant commercial freighters parked all over the place. His legs burned from the overexertion, each step sending pain through his whole body. Yes, I'm almost at the ship, he screamed back into the communicator. He could see his target, the embassy ship. He rushed towards the boarding ramp and from a few support staff and signaling him to move faster. Nakstani had probably contracted them too, because the vehicle's engines were already turned on, filling the air with a piercing noise, raising a dust cloud and wind that tugged at Dalcat's clothes and buffeted his exposed silvery skin. Nakstani, he said as he climbed down the ramp and entered the vehicle. Try contacting the Terrans using the ship's quantum relay. Maybe we can still negotiate a truce, or stop them from shooting us down as we get up there. I don't listen. You need to walk the council. Type G emerge. It's an expo. What she said? Type G emergency. Dalcat moved towards the front of the ship. His steps muffled by the carpeted floors. He had to use his hands to grasp the door handles and walls to keep his balance. His spaceship was already starting its ascent. It's a what? He asked. It's an ex a door. The link died. It was still time to decipher Nectani's words when he reached the strip's narrow cockpit. He all but climbed into the free seat and the only pilot, a young female Dymphanyard, whose attention was currently focused on manually operating the vehicle. Her short brown coat of fur puffed up. Somehow, Dakout doubted the takeoff was following proper procedures. Nectani had said to warn the council. A Type G emergency. Type G, an event with the potential to cause grave loss of life and property across the entire of the Galactic Federal Council and its associated states. Type Gs were almost theoretical concept. Only one had ever been formally declared in the history of the Galactic Council, when an artificially engineered virus had spread across seven stellar systems, managing to kill hundreds of millions, declaring one here seemed excessive, even after witnessing the Terran's actions. So, what else had Noctani seen? Darkat engaged the ship's quantum relay from the console and started inputting his identification code. He glanced at the cockpit's window as he waited for the link to establish. The ship was now skimming the roof of the city houses, moving towards the monolith of the directorate building. He saw the locals and variants in the streets turning to run towards the nearby houses. Had the colonel authorities sounded the alarm... A few stopped to look at the passing vehicle, moving out of the way a little as the tornado engines they were creating. The console pinged, waiting for him to talk. This is Assistant Ambassador Dalcat, he said, Code 376 Sphere, speaking on behalf of Ambassador Naktani, Code 939 Sphere. I am declaring a Type G emergency originating in the Zinva Republic, Yovit system. He didn't miss the bewildered glance the pilot gave him. The console pinged again. The message had been passed on by the automatic receiver. The link was redirecting. Above that, there was dozens of white trails of lions slowly crisscrossing the sky. There was something... Something else, as Naktani said. What had she tried to say? An expo? An expo what? And just then, he remembered something. Terran. That was the corvette captain had said. The back of the Imperium Palace. Terran. Not Terrans. One. Singular. The Terran. A voice came out of the console. This is a permanent security dispatch speaking assistant ambassador Dalcat. Please confirm the declaration of a Type G emergency. Type G confirmed, he replied. Concise and to the point. Always be concise when speaking to dispatch, Nakstani had told him once. Describe it. The Zinva Republic had been attacked by an exponential replicator, codenamed Terran. Replicator appears to be intelligent and of artificial nature, and does not respond to communication attempts. Replicator is a ready and control of three, correction, four stellar s- Light. A deafening noise, a roaring shadow darkening it all. A fleeting moment of surprise as the left became down and right became up, rolling. Crashing, a searing flash of pain crossing his mind. Darkness. End of story. Chrysalis Chapter 6, written by Beaverfur. Their empty eyes stared at me. Four eyes per body, narrow eyes, two in front and two at the sides. 
My assault soldiers advanced along the desolated landscapes, passing the ruined skeletons of trees and collapsed buildings alike, their footsteps making crunchy noises as they stepped on terrain made uneven by piles of rubble, debris, and concrete scattered all around the ground. I had squadrons marching through every one of the planet's main small towns, searching, scanning, and sending their data to the main body in orbit. They were escorted from the air by a fleet of drones, flying through thick grey clouds of radioactive dust that covered the entire world's atmosphere. Zenvarian bodies were not in underground refuges. In fact, I hadn't found any of those so far. No, they were in the open, scattered, having been flung around by the hurricane-level winds were created when I had simultaneously detonated my 3,071 thermonuclear warheads all over the planet. In parts of the main city, the destruction had been so severe, it was hard to distinguish what had once been building or wide avenue. I had to refer to the maps I had made previously from orbit to figure out the direct my army towards the most useful locations. All things considered, though, the damage I had dealt to this planet was still lower than the one the Zimbarians had unleashed upon Earth. Albeit irradiated, this planet still had oceans, for one. Or maybe it was a matter of time. If I had started a nuclear winter, maybe a few years from now temperatures would come crashing down, causing an ocean water to freeze and recede. It was an interesting thought, one worth verifying, so I separated a few drones and sent them to stay as a permanent orbiting satellites, monitoring this world's future evolution. A monument. I had once wanted to build a monument to humanity. It was important. I felt deeply rooted urge to fight, to rebel against the idea of time ticking by, of the lost memories of our species being left behind as the galaxy spun by, of having been nothing amounting to nothing but some irrelevant blip on someone else's history books, of being forgotten. This... This destruction, this ruin, it was retribution, yes, it was vengeance, but it was so much more. It was also remembrance. It was our cry of pain, defiance, and fury. A cry so high and so strong that cities crumbled and worlds died under it. A shout that would linger in the air for centuries, even longer. A shout that they couldn't help but listen to, that nobody could ever pretend not to have heard. Yes, they would fear me for this, they would hate me, maybe even manage to kill me for it, but they would never forget. This, right here, it was a monument. Here and there, some survivors would try and fight my robotic soldiers, maybe a lone Zinvarian making a suicide assault, maybe a group of them carrying out a better planned attack from the distance. They would shoot at the machines using energy handguns or throw homemade explosives at them, and they would manage to disable or destroy a few. But inevitably, they would lose. They would be overwhelmed by the assault of the nearby robots, surprised that even an apparently downed soldier could still shoot back at them. Or they could be flanked and by a second squad, one they couldn't have seen through the dusty fog that covered everything and limited visibility to a few yards but whose approach had no problem coordinating. On some rare occasions, one of my drones equipped with an energy weapons would fly nearby and I would have it take care of the offenders. They would go down as if struck by an angry god, a bolt of lightning coming out of the cloud skies amongst the thunderous noise. I preferred it that way. It felt more uh, efficient, more optimal. I wasn't exactly sure how to feel about all of this, this destruction. I had almost expected it to be counted after I brought some level of payback to the Zinvarians. Not happy, exactly, but satisfied. Except I didn't feel like that. Not disappointed either, nor regretful. Just a detachment, that emotional indifference that I systematically erased the remaining menaces. As if a crossing off items on my task list. Just something that had to be done. Me being an appropriate, the only person available for the job. It was the stillness that annoyed me, that frustrated me to no end. Had I felt gleeful or regret, it would have meant that I was still human at some important level. But this, this lack of emotion, didn't know how to take it. Was it normal, expected human responses? Or was it a sign of my descent, of my becoming something else? 
All in all, my casualties were low, even when taking into account those robots that had fallen prey to the dangerous environment, with its shifting piles of rubble, sudden gas explosions, and hiding pit holes. When they weren't fighting, my soldiers shuffled through the remains looking for useful materials, artifacts, and working technology. This was a rare opportunity for me. Over the last weeks, I had learned much about the species I was fighting by examining the ships and facilities that I had conquered. I had used that knowledge to come up with the counters to their attacks and develop new, more resistant armor, better propulsion, and weapons. But in a sense, my knowledge still had been limited. All I had ever had access to was their military ships and resource extraction outposts, and a very narrow slice of their society. Right here, now, I was learning that the Zunbarians as a community, not only going through their barracks and ships, but also through their homes, markets, farms, factories, administrative buildings. They painted as much richer picture than the enemy that I was fighting, and my processing units raced to incorporate each piece of new information, to give it a sense, contextualize and categorize it, and look for ways that I could put it to use. I discovered that this society was internally segregated, different buildings and homes sporting banners identifying symbols of varying colors. I wasn't sure what the division represented, but maybe I would be able to exploit that in the future. The spaceport and its large cargo starships told the story of logistics, of interstellar supply runs and resource distribution. A story that already had me shuffling objectives in mind, reprioritizing possible targets to achieve the best strategy. The deepest impact on the Zinba Republic's trade and military supply chains. It was near the spaceport where I found it, a relatively small spaceship lodged between two buildings as if it had fallen down from the sky. Its entire rear part was missing, and the internal mechanisms, pipes, and corridors were all exposed to the dusty wind. But that wasn't what piqued my curiosity. No, what piqued my curiosity was that it didn't look Zunvarian. As a mass producer myself, I had begun to show some appreciation towards the Zunvarian's manufacturing techniques. Their spaceships appeared to be constructed by joining together a series of repeating smaller prefabricated modules, many of which were the same across all of their different types of spacecrafts that made up their fleet. It was clever, bulk production of those modules would cost much cheaper, and it probably allowed for easier orbital assembly in new ships. It was also the reason Zinberian space vehicles looked like an amalgamation of straight edges and odd angles, or more reason that they had so easy for my soldiers to board. Many modules featured more openings and vents than strictly necessary in a warship, but that, I guessed, would come useful in other types of ships' configurations. But the downcraft in front of my soldiers, it didn't look anything like that. This one had been purposely built as a whole, an aerodynamic shape that had been designed to look good, to be elegant and stylized, rather than with an easy build. With the help of a drone, I had three of my soldiers climb into the vehicle through the gaping hole. They advanced along the dark corridors using infrared cameras and seen in the dark. The ship had rolled over, so they was walking on what I'd assumed was the corridor ceiling. I maneuvered them slowly with caution, making sure that they wouldn't stop my ventilation grills from exposed pipes and wires. The corridor's walls, I noticed, also lacked the perennial hieroglyphical motifs that I'd learned to associate with Zinvarian decoration. No, these ones were surprisingly minimalistic, with nothing but very simple line designs and etched here and there. It reaffirmed my first impression that this ship wasn't local. I was already cataloging most of the interesting pieces of technology to recover from the fallen ship. Sadly, the thrusters, warp drive, and shield projectors were all missing. I assumed that they would find them wherever the rear of the vehicle had ended up, if it even existed anymore. But there were still many other devices I wanted to look into, such as the intricate quantum relay communicator, which appeared to be more advanced design than the ones I was currently using. I had two of the soldiers start to disassemble it while the other kept exploring the craft, moving towards the front. That's when I found the two creatures huddled in what I assumed was the ship's cockpit. One reminded me of a short, snouted fox covered in brown fur with large, pointy ears, although without any tail I could see. It was sitting in the corner further away from my soldier, hunched over with pain. It looked like the gravity hurt. Its clothes were covered in blood, yet it was conscious. 
The other I immediately classified as a male, a humanoid of smooth, silvery skin and graceful lines. He stood right between my soldier and the other hurt alien, aiming an energy handgun at the robot's head. He didn't look like he had ever been in a firefight, though. His aim was wavering and his body twitchy, but that could also be the result of his injuries. His face sported a red gash and his left arm hung useless and covered in blood. I had my soldier stop, and considering my options while the silver creature pronounced words in a language that I didn't understand, I could order my robot to attack, of course. The alien would shout at its head, but it wouldn't incapacitate the machine, only destroy its cameras. The radio transmitter control units were both in the chest area, so even with the blind I could still get to charge the creature and use its arms to tear it apart. This was something many Zinvarian troops had learnt the hard way. I had the other two robots in the ship stop their salvaging and move towards the cockpit. I could have just had them into guns blazing. The alien might be able to mow down one of the soldiers if he was fast, but that would be that. Or maybe I could use a drone, order the one flying machines to shoot a crash into the downed ship. It would destroy the whole cockpit section, erase the problem. A bit too excessive, perhaps, and it risked damaging the components that I wanted to retrieve. But there was something more, I noted. I didn't want to kill them. Oh, I wanted them to be gone. I wanted them to have died in the crash, maybe. It was an idea of shooting them that irked me. Deep down, I'd always known that going down this path, that engaging in revenge, risked turning me into something else. That if the stars were the planes where monsters lived, it should be so easy for me to become one of them. Now that I myself was living in that same endless void, and looking at the ruined planet, perhaps I had already crossed that line. But there had been a reason for that. I hadn't started this war, the Zumvarians had. I was merely taking their turf, bringing them to the same level of destruction, the same level of pain that they had previously unleashed upon us. On humanity. It felt righteous, like I was working towards some sort of balance, some sort of state of equilibrium, the same way the laws of physics did. Action and reaction. This though, shooting, no. Executing these aliens I knew nothing about would feel awfully close to starting a new conflict. A new war. I would be the aggressor here, and even if I suspected that they were collaborating with the Zinvarians, giving them their support and technology. Should I treat them as enemies that probably were, or give them a chance? I could capture them instead. Wasn't that what many armies had done to suspected spies of the past? I would need to build a suitable habitat for them, of course, maybe a custom transport ship to house the creatures, but that would be easy. I would then be able to interrogate them and use their knowledge in my favor. But again, that felt awfully close to an act of aggression. One lesser one, true, but still unwarranted if they happened to be innocent and just be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Besides, something about taking prisoners felt wrong. I didn't really need them. I could retrieve any information I wanted about their technology from the devices I had found in the ship itself. In fact, I guessed interrogating them on engineering specifics would be an arduous, useless task that wouldn't give me new information that I couldn't gather through reverse engineering. And I didn't care about their alien politics and intrigues. No, capturing them would only be delaying tactics. It didn't solve the fundamental decision I had to make, whether to consider them as enemies or not. If they were enemies, then I would kill them. If they weren't, then they had the right action would be to let them go. I almost wished the silvery creature would open fire, resolving my inner conflict, declaring openly his secret allegiance. Then I would be justified. Then I would be perfectly fine with my machines butchering them. But of course, he didn't. He just stood there spewing words and words and words, alien words in languages I didn't understand, like some sort of auditory mirroring of the radio messages the Zimvarian ship often bathed me in. Annoying. The thing was, I hadn't given that much thought and it would happen after. After the war ended, after the Zimbarians were done with, after my main purpose had been achieved, one way or another. Somehow, a part of me suspected that there wouldn't be any after, that achieving that objective, getting to that goal, might end up requiring complete sacrifice. But what if I was wrong? What if there was light at the end of the tunnel? And somehow I could come out of this trail having reached some sort of balance or inner peace. Then what? Maybe I could try and be to restoring humanity. I hadn't really thought about it. 
But if that was the case, then I would have to live somehow in this galaxy with these other species, unless I wanted to start a war against the entire universe. They would see me as an aberration, no doubt, a freakish mechanical horror, and I would always look at them with suspicion, knowing that they had tacitly supported the ones who killed humanity, that they had emboldened their destruction, even if it hadn't been through their passivity. But wasn't that human too, giving them the benefit of the doubt, trying to find some common ground? I didn't know. Truth was, I wanted to hurt them. I wanted them to feel their share of pain, and yet, so far, I had no actual reason to justify that, other than my own suspicions. In the end, I guessed I had no choice. I truly believed in justice above all. If I truly believed that my own cause was right, then I had to consider them innocent until proven guilty. An olive branch then. Slowly, I had my soldiers drop their weapons to the floor. It was symbolic, of course, a mere non-verbal message. If the alien decided to attack, I wouldn't really need the guns to put them down. The creature's eyes did a weird sort of blink, his surprise evident even to me. But he seemed to pick up on my intent and hesitantly placed his own handgun down. I ordered my leftmost robot to enter the cockpit and approach the fallen fox things. Its movement was slow and deliberate, each motion telegraphed so as to not scare the aliens. The silvery one eyed the machine warily, but didn't try and stop it. I had the robot offer a hand to the hurt creature, which looked surprised from the hand and the machine's faceplate and back at the hand. It asked something to its partner, which seemed to reply in an affirmative, then the creature grasped my hand. Strange to feel the sort of contact again, one that I'd almost forgotten about even if it was through a very limited tactile sensor on my salt robot's hand. I helped it stand upright. The creature let out a groan, and the silvery alien started moving towards the gun. For an instant, it looked like the tentative truce had been managed to establish was going to come crashing down. But then, the brown alien said something, and the partner visibly reacted. My robot started walking towards the cockpit's exit, half carrying the hobbling creature along the way. The other alien eyed the gun again and an indecision, but then followed them leaving it behind. I had my two other soldiers take the group's rear. Getting the pair of aliens out of the crash ship in a complex operation that took the longest part of the hour and involved a chain of assault soldiers working in conjunction along with support of three more flying drones. At points, I was worried the hurt creature would make it if fur covered the bright blood. I had a couple of robot squads go through the local area, looking for whatever past as first aid supplies for the Zinvarians. When I finally got them out of the wreckage and into the open, the silvery alien looked shocked. He stared around at the devastated landscape in silence, then pushed my closest soldier in the chest while screaming some unknown word over and over again. My soldier didn't budge. I wanted to say something, even though I wasn't sure what but I realized I hadn't designed my assault army with the capacity for speech in mind. I had never intended to negotiate with the Zinva Republic after all, so the machines just started him in silence, frozen. Eventually, he shook his head in a very human-looking sign of defeat and walked over to his partner. I had a drone land next to them and dropped the medical supplies I had managed to scavenge. This was as far as I could go. I wasn't a medic, didn't know anything about the alien's physiology or how to heal the wounds. Surprisingly, the silvery one looked as confused as I was, but the fox thing seemed more knowledgeable in the first aid and started giving out instructions to its partner, who set to work cleaning the wounds, applying some sort of gels on them and wrapping them in bandages. Two of my soldiers watched the procedure with interest, relaying the images to me so that I could file them in my memory databanks and go through them later, if I ever wanted to put in position to perform first aid on the fox-looking alien again. Meanwhile, I had my troops clear out a secure corridor of the crashed ship all the way to the remains of the spaceport, getting a small group of Zinvarians that were trying to set an ambush out of the nearby building. I knew that there was no point in saving the creatures just to abandon them to their own luck in this irradiated, ruined world. They wouldn't survive for long, nor in their condition. No, this was my attempt at not fighting the other civilizations, at shooting for some sort of coexistence. It would make no sense unless the rescued creatures could escape, survive long enough to get back to their respective homes and deliver a message for me. 
I had started working on that particular issue even before I managed to extract them over the drowned craft. If they were to leave the planet, they would need a vehicle. I knew my own drones weren't up to the task, even though many had carrying compartments for their own, where they could transport material, salvaged artifacts, assault soldiers and nuclear warheads when the occasion required it. They just didn't have any sort of life support system on board. I could always manufacture new types of drones, a new design able to transport living beings, and I might end up constructing a few of them in the future, just in case the situation presented itself again. But for the time being, I had figured out a faster way. Most, if not all, of the Zimverian ships parked in the spaceport had been damaged, yes, but they hadn't all been damaged in the same places, and the modules that they were built from had originally been designed to be interchangeable. So, I had set out to assemble my very own Zinvarian vessel out of the surviving pieces from three other different ships. It wasn't as easy as it sounded, though. Even the surviving modules had damage of their own, and the bent pipes and burned surfaces all over. I was using a relatively small patrol as a main chassis, since it had survived relatively intact and only needed some of its main components replaced. A fleet of drones was working on it, welding beams together, rebuilding the life support system, and attaching new power plant and engine blocks that I had extracted from a nearby freight transport crafts. Too much work for saving these two creatures, who hadn't done anything for me, who were probably friends with my enemy. Perhaps. But that olive branch I had wanted to offer, it had to be delivered. When the medical treatment was over, I set them to move, it took some gentle pushing for them to get the message, and one of my robots had to carry the hurt one in a bridal style. The silvery Aiden started when the first when that happened, but after a few words from his companion, he allowed it, even though he kept stealing glances at the carrying unit from time to time. The procession advanced slowly. It had to, while my assault troops had the infrared channel of their own cameras, the access to the detailed terrain scans of my scanning flying drones had created with their radar sensors. The aliens relied entirely on their own eyes and were victims to limited visibility. I also didn't want to risk the group falling into some unseen pit, so I had them follow a winding path that made the detours around some of the most unstable areas of the ruined city. It took them almost three hours to reach the spaceport, and by that time the impromptu spaceship I had assembled was ready to fly. Also, I hoped there was always the risk that it had just exploded on ignition with these things, but I doubted it. When the creatures saw the contraption for the first time, they stood frozen, exchanging words in their own language. What? Did that mean that they didn't like it? True, it wasn't my greatest design, but I was proud of what I had managed to build in such a short notice. The male turned to look at me, one at the soldiers, and he said something and waited, maybe expecting some kind of response. I had the machine point at them, the spaceport, and the sky in quick succession. He said a word, and his head bobbed slightly. Was that a nod? Something else entirely. The robot repeated the hand signs. Them, ship, sky. Them, ship, sky. This time the alien didn't say something. He just helped the injured creature get into the ship. After a few minutes of waiting, the vehicle's engine started and the craft began to move. Well, it hadn't exploded, at least. I watched the vehicle from a safe distance with my drones. It didn't leave the planet straight away, as I had anticipated. Instead, it flew over the ruined cities, making lazy circles around this particular set of ruins, as if searching for something. Curious, I consulted the map I had made from orbit. It was the place where one of the city's largest buildings had stood. Some sort of administrative facility, I guessed. Were they looking for some artifact, some critical weapon to use against me that they had kept in there? I didn't know, but whatever it was, I didn't think it would be good to move then let them have it. I thought I had been generous enough so far. I sent a couple of my drones and had them fly in formation, one to each side of their ship, forcing them to stray on course if they didn't want to crash into one of them. The aliens seemed to get the message and abandoned their search, accelerating to leave the planet. As for fleeting moment, I considered shooting them down. It would be easy, just have one of the drone's vector thrusters align 15 degrees of course. The drone would crash into the ship engine section, probably disintegrating the craft right away from the impact. Or, if they survived somehow, then they would both die when the vehicle crashed into the ground a couple minutes later. So easy. It would only require a thought. 
All this time I had been helping them, I had been working within the safety of knowing that my decision was reversible, that I could change my mind. I would have no problem killing them at any moment I chose. Until this moment, this was the point of no return. I left them leave now, I wouldn't have any way to retract that decision. I would be committing to it and the vague and dangerous idea of coexistence. I didn't do anything and watched with 10,000 eyes as the ships engaged a warp drive and slipped out of normal space, out of my reach. An olive branch. I wasn't a monster. Not yet. Maybe. In the planet below, the Zinvarian empty eyes withered as their own judgment on that. With the mental shrug, I started the preparations for the next move. I recalled some of the machines left and others on the ground with updated orders, starting spooling out my own war drive my mind already considering how to approach the next battle, what reinforcements I needed to manufacture, which system I should attack next. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.